Greetings! Welcome to Gummy's Long Book Corner, where we take a look at fine pieces of Kaiju related literature. Today, we will be taking a look at Matthew Denian's Atomic Rex, A Tale of Kaiju Apocalypse. No, not that Kaiju Apocalypse. We shall begin, as always, with the plot. After a nuclear weapon test on a secluded island results in the emergence of giant monsters, the world becomes overrun with radioactive kaiju. The last remnants of humanity in North America, despite their best efforts to fight back using giant robots, are reduced to a small colony with only a single robot, Steel Samurai, left to protect the dwindling population. Steel Samurai's pilot, Chris Myers, is forced to make a difficult choice in order to enact an incredibly risky plot. Use Steel Samurai to lure the largest and most powerful of the monsters, the true kaiju, into each other's territories and get them to fight each other to the death. Can Chris's plan succeed? And can he defeat Atomic Rex, the powerful true kaiju that left him the last giant robot pilot on Earth? This book is in some ways very similar to that kind of apocalypse, but there is one big difference. Atomic Rex is actually fun to read. For starters, the main kaiju that appear in this story, referred to as true kaiju to differentiate them from the lesser mutations, are given individual traits and, dare I say, personalities that make them stand out from each other. It also helps that most of the true kaiju are clearly based off of monsters from more famous giant monster movies. The first of the true kaiju to appear is Tortorouse, a giant turtle clearly inspired by Gamera, but which can spit acid rather than fire, and who can also fly, but in a much different way than its inspiration. While Yokozuna, a giant mutated human with a voracious appetite, doesn't appear to be based on any specific kaiju, I can't help but feel that it was inspired by the more generic giant human monsters, specifically Glenn Manning from The Amazing Colossal Man and War of the Colossal Beast. While not nearly as large as the other monsters, a swarm of giant ants, the colony, are similar to the ants from them, while the much larger Helodon is likely based off of the giant Gila monster. A diminutive but incredibly strong and resilient ape kaiju, Ogre, is reminiscent of King Kong, even down to his shorter stature and fondness for human women. But personally, I kept imagining the Beast Titan while reading the book. Then there's Amebos, who is so similar to the Blob that the book even gives it the same weakness to cold as its film counterpart. The twin frilled Dimetrosars doesn't really seem to be based on any kaiju, but could just simply be a nod to dinosaur films in general. And last, but certainly not least, is the titular kaiju, Atomic Rex, who is not so subtly based on the King of the Monsters himself, Godzilla. However, Atomic Rex's description in the book isn't so much based off of Godzilla's classic show and Heisei looks, but rather Zilla from the 1998 film. Or early Millennium Godzilla, if you want to go that route. There are also many other giant creatures that appear throughout the book, some of which are even given proper names and are shown to be as strong as the true kaiju. But if I were to go over every monster in the book, I'd be here all day. And being the titular monster, Atomic Rex is given a lot of screen time, allowing the reader to get a better understanding of the true kaiju and how they operate. And as expected, it's incredibly primal and instinctual, but still really insightful. But thankfully, it's not just the monsters that are well executed. The two main human characters of the story are also given an incredible amount of depth for the rather short length of the book. As mentioned before, Captain Chris Myers is established in the book's prologue to be the last surviving pilot of the small army of giant robots that were created to combat the kaiju. And that makes him incredibly lucky, since the same prologue established just how ineffectual the robots were against the true kaiju, with Chris only surviving because his partners took the brunt of Atomic Rex's attack once he made landfall for the first time. Though he's the last hope of protecting what's left of humanity, the survivors of the kaiju are not shown to be grateful for the difficult decisions Chris is forced to make in order to keep them alive. 
So the fact that Chris seemingly abandons them doesn't come as much of a surprise. But Chris doesn't simply abandon the survivors, but rather he decides that it's worth the risk of potentially losing them to the smaller monsters he thanklessly protects them from in order to pit the true kaiju against each other in the hopes that they wipe each other out and create a safer world for the survivors in the long run. Rather than sit around and watch humanity slowly die off due to their dwindling resources. And then there's Kate Summers, one of the women kidnapped by Ogre for reasons that perhaps even Ogre doesn't know. By the time she's introduced, only three women are left alive in Ogre's custody, with those that tried to escape being killed by either Ogre or the other monsters that roam the area in search of food. Unfortunately for them, the only thing keeping them alive is Ogre, but even he can't protect them forever, and Kate becomes determined to survive, and she's incredibly resourceful in her plans to do so. The stories of these two do eventually merge, and from start to finish, A Comic Rex is an exciting read with plenty of giant monster action and plenty of human drama as well. This book has a few problems here and there, but those are mostly just spelling and grammar errors. And those are easy to look past, given how otherwise well-written this story is. And the book did well enough to get some sequels and spin-offs, so I'm excited to check those out. While it's nowhere near as good as the Nemesis books, but given that it's a pretty high bar to reach, I can still highly recommend giving Atomic Rex a read. Until next time, farewell.